My name is Parmi Olson. I'm a journalist with Forbes. I started off in radio journalism and eight years ago I joined Forbes in their London bureau writing about business and markets and currencies. And then a few years ago started focusing on technology. And then a couple years ago started writing about um, Anonymous. And I wrote a book about it. Oh. Yep. And uh, now, Forbes magazine probably isn't the kind of publication that you would expect one of their journalists to write about a bunch of young, anarchic people who go around uh, subverting things on the internet and actually don't make much money at all. Um, so just to explain why I ended up writing about Anonymous, in 2010, Forbes opened up a blogging platform, and that allowed journalists like me to focus on a topic that we were interested in and write about it with as much frequency as we wanted. Now, I got lucky because in that same year, December, uh, Anonymous carried out one of its most notorious attacks against a series of financial companies to avenge WikiLeaks and to avenge the arrest of Julian Assange. Now, I was reading about this. I've always been interested in disruptive figures and underground societies. And I got tired of reading about rehashed articles online, and so I started interviewing some of the supporters. And eventually, I made contact with some senior, senior organizers and realized that this wasn't just a group. This was a whole culture with a history, with etiquette and its own language almost, with uh, jargon. And so that really fascinated me. And so I became obsessed with tracking these guys and ended up getting in contact with some senior figures who created LulzSec, which was a splinter group of hackers. And uh, I was tracking them every day behind the scenes and also what they were doing in the public eye, which was attacking uh, cyber attacks against big names like Sony Pictures and Fox News, even the FBI and the CIA. And so the next few months of reporting, very hair-raising. I had hackers threatening to destroy the company I was working for. Um, I watched my sources get paranoid. Um, I was able to meet some of them face to face through convoluted means of encrypted communication, and then some of them got arrested. It was actually quite emotional at times. And what I learned was that a lot of these guys were young men, unemployed and quite isolated in society. Um, extraordinarily intelligent, but also often lack lacking an extraordinary amount of common sense. It was full of contradictions. Um, so, for example, this is Jake Davis, who I met face to face before, uh, while he was still part of LulzSec and before he was arrested. And online, he was Topiary, that was his nickname. He was the leader of one of the co founders of LulzSec and this witty, charismatic kingpin in the community. But face to face, he was a scrawny young man um, who was actually not particularly good at socializing and quite shy. Of course, he's not like that anymore. That was, this was a while ago. I also learned about a website called 4chan, and you'll hear a little bit more about this from Cole Stryker, my colleague, who's really investigated this. And this is a website which Anonymous started on. Um, it's been called, uh, well, I won't say the word, like the armpit of the internet, because it hosts a lot of uh, porn and graphic violence. But at the same time, it is also a, a place where people come to honestly discuss their fears and their proclivities and their inhibitions. And one of my interviewees, who I called William in the book, and this is, he allowed me to take a picture of him by covering his face, um, went on 4chan for many years, every day. This was like his life. And this was a place where he could honestly talk about things with people in such a way that he couldn't in the offline world. It was a real community for him, even though he knew no names, no nicknames or anything. So I'll just give you a, a brief rundown on some of the key things I learned about Anonymous and what it was. Well, first of all, when we were first reading reports about Anonymous, it was referred to as a group of hackers, which is not true. It was not a group. It was more of a network of ever-shifting nodes. And most of them were not hackers. Most of them didn't know programming languages. Um, most of them were actually just very good at trolling or knew the community very well. Um, and also, the attacks that they carried out were very easy to do. They would download simple web tools from the internet, um, which had been previously uh, created for penetration testing by IT security guys, subvert those tools and use them to launch cyber attacks. Super easy to use. And another key thing I learned was about the huge amount of fear that existed in Anonymous, and I mean red-hot paranoia, constant. And part of that fear was about getting arrested, but an overriding fear was about getting doxxed. 
To be doxxed is to have your online identity unveiled and your real identity attached to that online identity. Now, Anons would spend months, sometimes more than a year, cultivating a nickname online with a personality and everything else. And so, as soon as your real name was revealed, the value of that online identity was lost. And this was the case with people like Jake Davis when they were found out to be the real topiary. And so it was a huge threat. Nobody wanted to be doxxed, but that threat was constantly being tossed around. So for me, in hindsight, that raises a lot of questions about privacy. Because I think for a lot of these guys, anonymity was the one true way to experience privacy in an age when corporations and governments know more about us than ever before. Last December, about two years after I wrote my book and researched Anonymous, I moved from Forbes in London to uh, transferred to San Francisco, where I started studying and researching mobile technology in Silicon Valley. And I can't begin to tell you what a jump into the deep end that was, and also how surprised I was by the blase attitudes that I was encountering among executives, startups, entrepreneurs, about the privacy of consumers that they were building tech technology for. And I think a fundamental reason for that is because of the way our personal data translates into dollar signs. So it took an executive at a company called Nuance, which is a voice recognition company, to put it really succinctly for me, this particular attitude. He said that privacy was an economic consideration. Now, this executive was helping Nuance, which does the voice recognition technology for the iPhone Siri, to create a personal assistant technology um, separate to that, that could go beyond Siri and cross-referencing all the data between our different apps on our phones, kind of like a butler that has the keys to all the doors in your house and all the cupboards and every safe, just to make them that little bit better at what they do. And I asked him about, wouldn't consumers find that a little bit odd to have their privacy infringed like that? And he answered, just again, I feel like this illustrates the attitudes in Silicon Valley. Um, when do people feel their privacy has been breached? And then he said, when information has been taken from them without value and exchange. All that information that resides in the cloud can be parsed and anticipated and thought through and synergies made that I'd never thought about before. There's an astonishing amount of value in that information. People talk about value a lot. Other than maybe my DNA, it defines me. It's where I am, what I do, who I talk with, all my relationships. It's basically forming a structure that's quite a rich definition for who I am. Now, I think it's true that data goes a long way to defining us as individuals, as well as the things we own and say and think. But what does it mean for our individuality and our identities if someone else knows about those things without our express permission? Now, supporters of Anonymous often weren't much better when it came to privacy infringement. Um, they often said that information should be free, but then the organizers of Anonymous would keep their names secret and also, at the same time, attack a company like Sony Pictures and release millions of passwords of consumers along with email addresses and names and cite that as collateral damage. So there's some complexity there about what kind of information should be free. Information that's in the public interest, information about institutions, individuals. So that debate's raging on. But one thing I know for certain is that information about us is being traded all the time more and more behind the scenes. Increasingly, even, a price is being put on your head every time you open up a mobile app, like Candy Crush. I don't know if anybody here plays this. I have avoided, actually, downloading this game. But in the past, a developer of a game like Candy Crush how would they make money? Well, they would sell ads through an ad network. And this ad network would sell a few thousand impressions, which is the promise of being seen by a few thousand people to an advertiser like Nike. So that model's changing now. App developers can insert an analytical tool into their app that tracks how people are using the app so they can make the app better, but also so that an advertiser can better target that person with ads and so the developer can make money. One of the biggest players in this game is a company called Flurry. Um, you might not have heard of them. They're, they've got an analytics tool, which they give away to developers. And because of that tool, Flurry is now on 1.2 billion smartphones in the world today. 
That's on an average of 10 apps on each of those phones. That means it has more mobile data than Facebook and Google. Now, Flurry triangulates all that data between the apps and puts them into and creates personas and categories for people, and it aligns each smartphone with a category. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Flurry used to be an ad network, but it's now becoming an ad exchange, as are a lot of other similar companies, like a stock market for selling mobile ads. So that instead of showing an ad to thousands of iPhone users at once, Flurry holds an automatic auction to decide in the tenth of a second which ad should be shown to a single person the moment they open Candy Crush while they're sitting in an airport. So the ad isn't for a thousand people, it's for one person. Now, crucially, Flurry knows a little bit about this person. It knows that she's a woman, that she's a new mother, that she's a traveler, and that she likes fashion. And in a split second, an ad for sunglasses shows up on her screen. Flurry says, this is how you show the perfect ad. It has nothing to do with the ad itself and everything to do with the person who's seeing it. Now, Flurry says it doesn't know names, that it anonymizes everything. But um, it is possible, as we heard earlier, cross-reference one other piece of identifying information with another in a security breach, and you can get names. Flurry's CEO told me last month that the personas it's creating about people are getting better for advertisers. It has 50 personas now. By the end of the year, it'll have 100. And who knows, at some point, it might start um, taking in third-party data, like location data from other brokers, to augment those personas. So I think it's often said in the debate about privacy in the Western world that there is this tension between privacy and security. But what if there's a wider, potentially more sinister conflict between privacy and convenience? Consumers love free. They love things to be convenient. More and more apps that are on the App Store are becoming free, and developers are increasingly making money through ads and ad exchanges like Flurry. Now, I don't know how far certain technology companies in Silicon Valley will take their deep dive into our data and our individual identities, I don't know how far they're going to get to knowing who we really are and doxing us all. Now, we might not be supporters of Anonymous, but our ability to keep an identity private boils down to the same thing that the Anons were trying to achieve, which is a sense of control. How much control do I really have over my personal data anymore? What decisions are being made about me that I don't know about? How will these decisions affect my life in the future? Now, Anonymous, in many ways, was an unconscious backlash to all of that tracking, as well as the huge diffusion of celebrity, of people taking their private lives public through platforms like Facebook and YouTube and Vine. And backlashes like this often come from young people, because I think young people see things as they are. They're not bogged down by baggage and systems and experience. A bunch of young people started Anonymous in the mid-2000s as a way to vent and bully and hack and protest all of the wonderful and terrible things that make us uniquely human. And they did so at a time when it was becoming increasingly difficult to become anonymous online, and in some pockets of modern society to be human as well, perhaps, with uh, so many algorithms that, and quants and trading desks that are deciding and helping to determine what we click on, what news articles we click on, or what music we listen to, or what movies we are going to watch, or what we watch on TV. There's a famous theory posited by Ray Kurzweil of the computer-human singularity happening by 2045. Well, maybe by then, if another network of ano uh, like Anonymous is created by a new generation of people, my guess is they won't gather online anymore, because the very definition of going online will be to forego any privacy or anonymity at all. Maybe they'll just shut down their devices, take off their augmented reality glasses, open the door, and go outside and meet one another face to face. Thank you very much. <laughs>